about uh, the epidemiology of human leptospirosis virus in New Zealand in uh, the past 18 years, so 2019 to 2016. I'll briefly touch on the history. Um, so as Michael mentioned earlier this morning, its incidence in New Zealand is high compared to other temperate um, countries. And, and historically in New Zealand, it's mainly been occupational with farmers and meat workers making the majority of the cases. <coughs> and so notifications are high in rural areas. <coughs> um, it was first identified in 1951. 20 years later, we reached an incident peak of nearly 900 cases. Um, vaccination was implemented in early 1980s and it saw a decline in cases. I just wanted to mention that the vaccinated vaccination had two serovars from two different uh, species, both Peter's high and intelligence. Um, and by late 1990s, the incidents were less than 100 per year. So there's a couple of previous epidemiology studies um, that looked at leptospirosis in New Zealand. One was between 1990 to 1998, and the other one was in early 2000s. And both these studies showed an increase in uh, non-vaccine uh, non serum bound. So for this study, I'll be looking, as my title suggests, epidemiology from 1999 to 2016. Um, the data for this study was collected by the Institute of Environmental Science and Research. Um, so it's a notifiable disease in New Zealand and um, patients present and uh, physicians either notify their medical offices of health and their specific district health boards um, and laboratories get, get um, probable or positive cases also notify the district offices of health. and so. Um, I have notification data that is managed by um, ESR in the surveillance database episode, and these are all um, confirmed or probable cases. So I received this data from ESR in a de-identified manner to protect um, confidentiality, and I'll be presenting a descriptive analysis looking at incidence, demography, including age, sex, and occupation, looking at hospitalization data and changes in pattern um, of serovirus and over time. So this graph shows the annual incidence in the past 18 years, years on the x-axis and incidence on the y. We had a total of 1,556 cases in the past 18 years. Um, this is a um, lowest regression in, shown in blue line and there's a 95% confidence interval in gray shading. Um, so what basically we see is a slight increase in the early 2000s followed by um, a decline to what we were seeing in the um, late 1990s. Um, what's um, striking is um, three incident, uh, significant incident peaks in 2002, 2008, and 2012. And the numbers on top show the incidents in these years. I've also divided the um, incidents by Cerova because um, uh, I wanted to introduce Cerova because I'll be talking about this a little later. Um, there's four predominant Cerovas in New Zealand that causes um, disease. It's Bell, Hydro, Pamana, and Tarasovai. And a large portion of cases are from, from Cerova Hydro, and this mirrors the animal incident trend that we see. Um, I also wanted to put the unknown Serovar. So these are notified cases that didn't notify Serovar, and this number is quite large. Uh, the next thing I looked at was population demography of the cases. So there's incidence on the x-axis, age on the y-axis, um, and the boxes, uh, red for female and blue for male. Uh, the size of the boxes show the size of the group. So as you can see, the blue boxes are quite large. So 95 but I think about 90% 90, 90 of um, cases in this 18 year period were males. And um, I've pointed out to Cerebra Bellon and Cerebra Pomona where um, the uh, percentage of females notified were higher compared to Cerebra Hydra and Cerebra Tarasovai. Um, I also looked at age, so I've put a Put 
put a line in the middle of the um, lowest median, and there's not a lot of difference in the median age of people notified with Hajo Pomona or um, Teresovai, but there is a significant increase in the age of people notified with Bellum. Um, also, the median age of females um, that were notified with Bellum and Pomona is higher. Uh, I looked at hospitalization data, so nearly half the cases, 48%, were hospitalized. Um, and if you look at um, Bellum and Pomona, you can see that it's um, positively associated with hospitalization. I also put the uh, species um, of the serovar, so the severity of disease is not specific to uh, um, a spe one species, it's Walpitosomai and interrogans. Um, I looked at occupation. So uh, as I mentioned before, um, in New Zealand, it's uh, mainly farmers and meat workers. And in the past 18 years, about 82% of cases were directly exposed to animals. And um, I'll just draw your attention to the large portion of each um, graph. So uh, Belm has a large portion of occupation that is um, not traditionally um, high-risk occupation in New Zealand. So these include accountants and I don't know, lots of other stuff. Um, and uh, um, Hajo and Pomona, um, a large portion is meat workers and um, Tarasova, quite a large portion, are uh, dairy farmers. I also wanted to oops, um, point out the light uh, yellow section, which is um, farmers, but this is not um, specified as to whether they are dairy farmers or dry stock farmers, and I think this data would be important. I also looked at change over time, so over this 18 year period. Um, most notification cases were less than 100 in this time period, and it's hard to see change with such a low number of cases, so I've picked the um, peak incident years that I showed in the first graph. So these are 2002, 2008, and 2012. Um, so the, um, this is a map of New Zealand, and it's divided by um, the district health boards, and each district health board has the, the pie shows the incidence in each district health board. So if you look at 2002, it's quite um, blue and green, which is Pomona and Hajo. And then you move to 2008, you see a little bit more of red, which is Ballum. And if you look at 2012, there's a lot more of red and purple, which is Ballum and Tarasovai. And the blue and green bubbles have decreased a little. Um, and the last thing I looked at was um, seasonality. So this is um, the graph of um, incidence over the 18-year period per month. Um, so month on the x-axis and frequency on the y. And um, uh, the one thing that really pops out when you look at this graph is there is a um, very low cases in the middle of the year for Sarova Tarasovai. And um, I just wanted to mention this because Jackie got a question yesterday. She presented data from 2017, and she also saw this trend. So I wasn't going to include this, but I'm going to include it. Um, this is a distribution of dairy farms in New Zealand, and I showed earlier the pie chart where Tarasova was quite high um, in dairy farmers. And this is the incidence of um, Tarasova over the past 18 year period. 18 year period yeah. Um, and it's in the same region that um, there is um, high dairy farms. So th this could be one of the explanations as to why we see a um, decrease because in New Zealand over winter they, um, uh, they don't milk cows. It's called dry cow period, I think. Um, and, uh, and so the exposure to humans, to these animals, are much lower in this time period. Um, so I just wanted to um, say the conclusions are based on observational trends only. Um, so for demography, um, I could see that there were older cases with cerebral bellum, more bellum and Pomona notifications 
with Woolla compared to the other two um, zero bars and the median age for these women were higher than the men with these zero bars. Um, greater hospitalization with thalamin and pneumonia and um, larger conditions are associated with um, specific zero bars. Um, changing pattern. So we can see an increasing number of thalamin and pterosova looking at actual incident numbers as well. Um, and pterosova is associated with the winter trough. And um, I think um, I found this that having this data would be quite helpful with um, uh, knowing exactly where intervention could be, knowing cerebri and exactly what occupation. Um, so next step, um, what I call real epidemiology. So um, actually doing some analysis, quantifying association, adjusting for confounders, um, examining seasonality and looking to see what these um, non-high-risk occupations are. And um, to do this, I had to tick some things on my list. So I'm not an epidemiologist, so I took a crash course in special epidemiology. I learned coding language, and I um, somehow convinced Jackie that I could do this. <laughs> um, and this is our team, laptop team at Messi. Thank you. Um, before vaccine companies rush out and put Valum and Tarasovi in our products, we need to be absolutely convinced that the source of infection is coming from the livestock they're working with. And I'm particularly interested in the pie graphs you had up there, because when you look at the ratio of um, meat, workers, uh, um, yeah, meat workers to farmers with Pomona and Harjo, very different to the ratio with Valum and Tarasovi, yes. where you've got a much smaller proportion of meat workers getting infected. So if the source of infection is definitely urine infected animals, then why do you explain those ratios? How do you explain the difference in those ratios? Well, so these um, these cerebrals are associated with different animals. So if, if I go back to my pie chart. Um, so, perhaps Terrasova is associated with dairy farmers. We know that vellum is highly associated with rodents, so this exposure could be from recreational water. It could be rodents from farms, because if you look, um, this is all farmers, and this is dairy farmers, so half of it is farmers. So, I mean, we need to look at source attribution more closely to say which cerebra is coming specifically from where. Thanks very much. Can I comment to this graph because I think this is really, really striking uh, and, and to the question as well. I, I believe what this, the hypothesis that we have about this graph is in relation to the use of vaccination of Hajo, Hajo and Pomona vaccination. I, I, that's what I take from that graph. Meat workers are getting Hajo and Pomona. Um, there are other, some other farmers are as well, but to me that's a striking feature of that graph. Hey, thanks, Jackie. Um, thank you, Chase. Um, 